So, yeah, so far on the market, what I've found is you have two options with the Japanese beetle lure traps. In as far as bag colors go, active ingredients aren't much different. But if you'll notice, the bag on the right is a darker green, and I've used that before, and it doesn't show up as much. I don't know if it matters to you aesthetically. If it does matter, you'd want to choose that one. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a the kind I have currently here this year. It's brighter, it's white, it's green. Um, it just doesn't blend in as much with the rest of the surroundings. But that's a personal choice. I, both of them are just as functionable. This is the kind of damage the Japanese beetles do. You can see they eat in between the veins and uh, they can do a lot of damage. Apple trees, any ornamental trees, shrubs. Uh, here's our bag and you'll notice it's a little puffy down on the bottom so we have some some pest in there and that's the lure it's non-toxic I mean I guess everything's toxic you wouldn't eat it but it's not a central nervous system disruptor or a typical insecticide it's just an attractant to the Japanese beetles I hear different theories on whether or not you should use the Japanese beetle traps. Um, I can tell, because some people think, oh, you're going to lure those Japanese beetles into your territory. But that has not been my experience. Um, this property, 10 years ago, was absolutely inundated with Japanese beetles. Literally, the bags were would be filled up three, four, five inches with hundreds and hundreds of Japanese beetles in them. And no pesticide application done was, was done on this lawn uh, during that time or since regarding Japanese beetles. And um, they've been all but eliminated, except for this year, 2017, we got a lot of rain this year. And the Japanese beetles I noticed around the edge of the property, I started seeing them. So we call this property the ecotone, where the turf meets the forest or forested area. And I always like to put the traps in that area. Uh, whether or not you're using something like a midacloprid or some other Japanese beetle insecticide, bifenthrin, whatever you might be using, uh, this will keep the Japanese beetles, at least it'll draw them to the ecotone area or from the ecotone area. Um, less of a chance of them, I guess, flying out on your lawn, but they still can for sure. Uh, what they have been doing, I believe, over the last decade is uh, breeding on, in this ecotone and dropping down right there and completing their life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, adult in that ecotone area without really reaching out into the grass area. But you can see this grass is not, is, uh, not been affected by Japanese beetles yet. Uh, there's, there's a couple of dead spots, but we've checked them out, dug up to see if there are any grubs. There aren't any. This particular spot right here is because there's a large oak tree, as you can see, and that thing sucks the the uh, moisture right out of the ground in a lot of different places. It's always been that way. You can, we've reseeded it over and over and it just still comes back a little weak. So with the irrigation, that would solve that problem. However, uh, the homeowner here chooses not to irrigate. So what do Japanese beetles eat? Well, they eat just about everything. Here's another trap and you can see we have an adult right here on the trap excuse me, on the leaf, and it's right there. Uh, one of the neat things about Japanese beetles is they have developed over the years, I don't know how long they've been around, uh, it depends on your beliefs, thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever it is, but they don't fly away, even though they do have the capability of flight, they're not going to take off, but what they do is they drop when the branch gets disturbed. Oh, was I wrong? See? You can't ever trust an entomologist. All right, let's go over and find another one and see if it'll do what we want. 
Moving right along, I'll never say anything again on a tape without editing it first. Let's see what we can find. Okay, so we have a mating pair right here. You can see them. And I'm just gonna come over here and let them know I'm around. And see, they're not, there you go. See how they dropped? So they drop and then take off. I'm gonna transport these because I'm one of those kind of people who doesn't like to let them go. Ah, another one came back. So that one came right back. So what I'd like to do is just drop them right back in the bag. Lost one. Uh, it's better when you have two hands to do this. You tilt the bag up and drop them there and they slide right in. You can see down there. They don't, really, they don't have an option of uh, coming out. Uh, while I'm over here, I'm going to point out something. The manufacturer, this is Spectricide's product. You'll notice these little dots. Let me get some sunlight on you here. And you'll notice these little dots right here. These are pinholes that the manufacturer has put in there. Now, I didn't call them and ask them. I don't know if it's for for air. Um, I think it's supposed to be for drainage, but if that's the case, it doesn't work very good. And what happens is this bag, if you get rain for several days, this bag will start to fill up, and those holes really won't let the water drain. And then the next thing that happens is all the Japanese beetles you've caught in here are going to start to rot and the smell is unbelievable it is literally like a rotting carcass and then you'll notice the japanese beetles will stop coming there because they're no long it, it repels them in some way so what i've done as a modification is uh, when i put the traps together let me get this thing back i do a little cut right on the very bottom and that way when the when the product fills excuse me if the water gets in the top of the bag and drains down it drains out now you want to be careful how you cut that i'll show you later when i actually open up a new bag you don't want to cut it too big if you cut it too big they can crawl out so you want it just enough so the water will leak but the insects don't let's go back over here this they love this particular plant if you're not familiar with it it's called stinging nettle and just getting it on your hands, your arms, or your legs, it's like little tiny pricks from an insect, like a wasp or something. Not, not terrible, but extremely itchy and depends on the person, right? Some people will have a lot worse of a time with it. I, I have, uh, well, I'll see if I can show you. I get a very bad rash from it. I was in it the other day, and just it just... Uh, itches an awful lot so here is a Jap another one another Japanese beetle so let's see if we can do that drop thing we're gonna wiggle the plant a little bit and see if he drop see he dropped so they like to do that or I'm not sure if they like to do it but it is an instinct of theirs so we're gonna come back uh, tilt the bag up a little and I'm gonna drop him right in so he's in whoop, he got away I'm not having very good luck. There's one flying around right there. I don't know if you can see him. So they're very attracted to this lure, which is kind of neat because, you know, it's you don't have to put toxins out in your property and you still get to catch a lot of them. Now you have to think, well, what if I only catch a few? Well, I'm going to tell you later what a difference that makes in the presentation because based on how many of these oh here's a whole bunch of them see them in here I really need two hands but I'm gonna try to catch a few let's see if they drop off I'm getting stinging nettle all over my hands this is great oh maybe it's a good idea to use gloves you know I never thought of that being a pest control specialist um, professional I guess so I'm gonna drop him right in there and let's see if he goes yep that one got in the bag and I like to puff these bags out a little. You can pull them on the sides. Otherwise, they tend to stick up in here. They won't get out. The insect won't get out. But eventually, I guess they could, and you don't want the water collecting too. So if you puff this bottleneck out when they fall in, it's, uh, it's a good idea. Let's go back again to the stinging nettles. Uh, we have some kind of butterfly there. Very nice action. Uh, people try to kill these, not the butterflies, but the stinging nettles, or they cut them down. A lot of insects collect on these, so it's kind of a, it's a nice plant, as long as you don't touch it. It's a great plant. And let's see if we can find any more here. 
I'm a little bit past the peak. About a week or two ago, uh, the peak of Japanese beetles occurred. And there used to be a lot more stinging nettle here, but they've devastated it. Here we go. So we're going to get a little drop off here. There you go. Got two. And I'm going to put them back in. Let's put them back in the hole. All right. It's pretty easy to tell what kind of damage they do. Uh, there's another one. Let's get them. Okay. Uh, the, you can see here again the kind of damage they do to the leaf. They they literally eat all around the veins. Here it appears they've eaten some of the veins. That might be another insect. Um, so we'll continue with a little bit of hunt for them. They're not, you're not going to find them in these green giants, arborvitaes, evergreens. That's not their thing. They like green leafy plants, even woody plants. So let's go over here. I'll uh, give you another example. This is a red maple and there's absolutely no effect. So you're not going to have to worry about these kind of plants with your Japanese beetles. But what do they do? Well, they like to eat all the other ornamentals you like. That's the adult version. And in the larval stage, they're going to come in and they're going to destroy your turf. Now, this turf <laughs> is not in really good shape, but this has nothing to do with Japanese beetles. This turf has never been treated with a pesticide. It's just seeded every couple years and um, it's holding up pretty good. So let's move along. See if we can find some more. There's some more. Another breeding pair right there. Okay, so we're going to grab them. Tap a little. This one doesn't like falling off, I guess. But I got him. Insect actors do not do what you want. I don't understand it. Um, they're not, maybe they're not getting paid scale or whatever. See these flying right around the trap. Look at him or her, I don't know which, but uh, there you go. So they just, oh look at where we might, we're not going to wait a long time, but I think we might, ah, almost caught one. Almost caught one. He's going right into the lure. And uh, let's see what happens here. Okay, he's up on top of the lure now. You can see him up there. Is he going to go down? Oops, better focus this right up there I'd like to give him help but he'd probably just fly away I think we might get some action here he looks like he might go down come on maybe he didn't read the script I'm gonna give him some help ooh there's something else coming along some kind of wasp. I say we tap him down. What do you say? Tap him down. Ah, there we go. We got him. I wasn't going to wait. I'm a very impatient entomologist. We got another one right over here. Let's just see how my what my theory on dropping is. If he thinks he's going to be touched. Nah. Oh, there you go. See the roll? They love to roll off. I hate showing people that because I don't like letting them get away. I want to catch them. Okay. Some more plants over here. Um, these are called wine berries. And the great thing about doing this kind of class with wineberries is you got to eat them. And you don't have to all that 
pricking like you do with the stinging nettles. So that's good. Mm. Okay, they like <laughs> they like the wine berries, but not so much. I've only seen a few of the of them on here during the day, so it's not a hot plant. If you want to, I don't think necessarily attaching a trap near them is going to make a difference either way. I have put the traps out, and there's some rhubarb which they don't appear to be attacking. I have put the plants out and had them fly into them within literally a minute or so at different parts of the property. So this stuff really attracts that eugenol and the other active ingredients in there really attract the uh, Japanese beetle. And we'll go over the label in a minute. Uh, these are some very hardy forsythia. No activity on the forsythia regarding Japanese beetle damage. But the Japanese beetles will attack pretty much any plant. So, uh, I'm, well, especially fruit trees. Now, they haven't touched this one. This is not a heavy year for them. As I said, we haven't had them in years. But this year, I started to notice a few. So, I decided to take the preemptive move and uh, take care of them. Now, this could be some damage from them right here. But certainly not enough to affect the tree or the fruit at this point anyway and we'll move down here here's another trap and i think we have one hanging right at the top again oh two of them see how they love this they love this stuff fall in there you go you can't see it now but one's crawling up my arm there he goes so what do we got in here I don't know if you can see, there's like a brown stain in there. And that's from the Japanese beetle. You get that on your hands too. Um, so you should wear gloves, I guess. You know, it depends on how squeamish you are. I just ate some berries off my hand. Look at this guy trying to get out. See, I cut that hole just a little too big right there. But he didn't make it. So you want to be careful on the size of those water cuts on the bottom. You know, that's a little too big. Nice, maybe an eighth of an inch, quarter inch at the most you want to cut them. Okay, so uh, they're coming from this ecotone. These aren't coming from the ground. As again, this turf is, does not have a larval problem. So, but they're coming from over in this area. We're drawing them out just a little bit. Uh, wouldn't be nervous about it. You're going to catch them. The whole point of drawing them toward the bag is you catch them. So the, that theory again about, well... We're going to draw them in and hurt our lawn. I totally disagree with that. It has been, not been my experience because you're catching them in the bag. Uh, okay, this has nothing to do with the class, but we got some rot there, so. All right, um, well, that's it for the Japanese beetles for now. And we're gonna go and uh, continue this class. We'll go over the label at some point. Um, thank you. Wait, we got a bonus clip. Uh, this is not a Japanese beetle. That was a bumblebee on an echinacea. It's a beautiful, beautiful insect. One of our pollinators. So I thought you might want to see it in action. Especially if you're watching this in the winter or a rainy, snowy day. You can remember what summer's like. This is a wildflower garden or weed garden and different times of the year it's July now but different times of the year all different insects come here to help the pollination process uh, we have some golden rods there's some wasp flying around there parasitic wasp we got a butterfly over there somewhere and usually in the evening there's a lot more insects here's a big beautiful butterfly so this is purposely left this, this particular part of the property is pur purposely left like this to attract these kind of pollinators and for the beauty of the flowers. Um, but, getting back to Japanese beetles, they will be able to breed in here. So, you know, that's one of the drawbacks. I'm not going to treat this with a pesticide of any kind because we have so many other beneficial and helpful, beautiful insects here. 
So uh, the traps work really good in a situation like this. I wish I could get close a better close up for you guys on this insect. That's the best that's coming out right now. Hey, butterfly. Hey, don't listen. Ah, did he listen? Butterfly. Nah. There you go.